It's that time, everybody. Welcome back to Waterview Online. And if you're new, I pray that this will not be your last time. We're thrilled that you're here. My name is Pastor Jason Bentley. And on behalf of the Waterview family, I just want to say welcome. And God's got some great things in store for us. Psalms 143 says, Let me hear in the morning of your steadfast love, for it's in you that I trust. Make me to know the way I should go, for to you I lift up my soul. That's what we're doing here today. And he continues, I am fleeing to you for refuge. Teach me to do your will. That's another reason we're here, for you are my God. And then I love how it wraps up. The psalmist says, let your good spirit lead me on level ground. He's got a good spirit. He's got everything good for each and every one of us. So here we are, and we are really excited this week because last weekend, one of our online audience that has been engaging with us that lives here locally in the Mooresville, Iredale County, Lake Norman area, made the leap and joined us for in-person gatherings. And we could not be more excited because that is what this online experience is really meant to be a peek in the window. It's not a replacement. It's not even a supplement. It is a peek in the window at who we are and what God is doing here so that if you're local, you can come and be a part of the family. We're about real community, real relationships, and that takes togetherness. So I wanna encourage you, if you haven't already, check out our small groups directory. We're right now in the middle of our fall semester of small groups and get connected. We've got different group options throughout the week about different things. Life is better when we're connected. You can look at our small group directory at our Waterview app or go to our website, www.waterview.church. Another thing that I want you to consider before we get into the word is that faith momentum and real spiritual growth requires that we're always taking next steps. After all, it is a fundamental law of physics that an object in motion will continue to stay in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. So we got to keep moving. So we offer launch. We call it launch because it's meant to launch you into all that God has for your life. And we have it available now digitally for you. Launch consists of step one, step two, and step three. And it highlights to you God's full and complete plan as we walk out this great faith adventure. If you've got questions about who we are as a church, questions about what God has in mind for your life, maybe you're looking to get more involved. Launch can be something that you do at the click of a button. There's a link that's coming up below, both for small groups as well as for launch that will give you more information, will enable you to sign up and to be a part of all that God is wanting to do through your life. Don't hesitate. Don't delay. You've been waiting long enough. Come on, we've been talking about making good decisions in our current series. Being in a small group and going through launch is a good decision. So right now, we're getting ready to go into the Word as we continue our series, Waking Up in Vegas. Focusing today on 1 Peter chapter number 3. That's in the New Testament. I'll give you a head start as you open up your Bible and your tablet. I hope you've got the Waterview app because we have a digital worship guide. All of the verses, all of the notes are there. You can follow along with us. But 1 Peter chapter number 3 is where we're going to start. Verse number 10 says this, For whoever desires to love life and see good days, and I think that's every single one of us. It's certainly me. I want to love life and see good days. 
The apostle Peter says, whoever wants to do that, in verse number 11, let him seek peace and pursue it. And then verse number 16 says, having a good conscience. So very simply, and we get right to the point here, whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him seek peace, let him follow peace, and secondly, live with a good conscience, live with a clean conscience. And so from this, for the next few moments, we're going to continue our series, Waking Up in Vegas, as I talk to you on the subject, it seems good. It seems good. Good, But I want to start today by asking you perhaps what might be a little bit of an odd question for a faith-based conversation like we're having, and for some, the church experience that you're in right now. But here's the question. Why are people who've had too much to drink inclined to make such bad decisions? And immediately, maybe some of you are thinking about some stories from your own past or maybe of a friend that just immediately springs to mind. But what is really the correlation between alcohol consumption and poor decisions? I mean, there is no correlation between alcohol and good decisions. Can we, can we agree on that? I mean, have you ever ever heard someone, anyone over the course of your life say, you know what? It is a good thing that I was drunk or I might have made a really bad decision. No, we know that when you're drinking, when you consume an excessive amount of alcohol, when you become intoxicated, inebriated, or drunk, you're going to make bad decisions. And this is because of a couple of physiological realities. The first is that as you're drinking and as your blood alcohol content begins to rise, it increases a chemical, the presence of a chemical in your brain that I can't pronounce. I'd love to give it a shot, but no, my pride's on the line. I can't pronounce it, but this acts as a stimulant. And a stimulant increases whether we're talking about this chemical or others that act as stimulants, it does two things. It increases impulsiveness and it decreases inhibitions. Both of those things together are not good. This is particularly a dangerous combination because when this happens, we have much less sensitivity to potential consequences concerning the things that we do and the decisions that we make. The second physiological thing that happens when we drink too much and why drinking always leads to bad decision is because an excessive amount of alcohol, it impairs the activity of the prefrontal cortex, which is the part of you that God gave to you in order to think rationally. It's actually where God placed the superpower that we all have. Remember, we talked about that in the very first week of this series. Our ability to choose, our ability to respond rather than react, our ability to weigh out what and how we're going to move forward is a superpower that God gave to every single one of us. He gave it to us at the beginning. That's the power of free will, the power of choice, the power of decision-making. So therefore, we could say that alcohol is the liquid kryptonite to your superpower. It gets a person to act without thinking clearly or without feeling appropriately. Alcohol has been known to make people brave when they should be cautious. It's been known to make people get loud, very loud, and embarrass themselves instead of being quiet and observe social norms and mores that are playing out around them. I, I heard the story one time of a man that was arrested while drunk, and when they were reading to him his rights, he responds, I have the right to remain silent but I do not have the ability. 
And some of us can think back on a time where we can really relate to his experience. Why? Why is all of this the case? It's because while drunk, we are temporarily desensitized to social, cultural, and relational clues. What happens is, is that we ignore the obvious because we're chemically incapacitated. That prefrontal cortex is being shut down and subdued. As a result, and this is the worst part, when we drink too much and when we become intoxicated, our conscience, which is living and breathing and is alive there in the prefrontal cortex, our conscience is suppressed. It's literally switched off. So you hear friends talking about their Friday night, their Saturday night, their weekend, and maybe you've even been there yourself because they drank too much and because their conscience was switched off and because they did things really without thinking of the consequences. Their response is, I did what? You're sure that was me? There's a video? So we're going to come back to this in just a moment, but really this leads us to part three of our series, Waking Up in Vegas, which is helping us make better decisions and live with fewer regrets. And if we will let the Lord help us, your life is going to be better. And the people who look to you and who depend on you, their life is going to also be better. And this is all going to be possible if, and this has been the big idea of this series, this will be possible if we ask better questions, if we answer honestly, and if we act appropriately. What I've been talking about the last couple of weeks and will continue to talk about for the next few weeks is that better questions on the front end of making choices will lead to better decisions. And we're exploring what those questions are in this series each and every time that we are spending time together because the Bible teaches us to filter all of the decisions that we are making through the framework of these questions. And the first we talked about last week, it was the honesty or the truth question. Simply put, am I being honest with myself really or am I selling myself on something that I'll regret later? Today, I want to talk about the conscience question. That's what we're going to focus on today is the conscience. We started talking a few moments ago about why drunk people make bad decisions. And we learned or we were reminded that it's because they cannot pay attention to internal cues. They are chemically incapacitated. And because they've drank too much, they have literally silenced their conscience. And that's why they do foolish things and make very poor decisions. However, us sober folks, oftentimes when it comes to making decisions, are guilty of something that is just a little bit different, but is just as bad. And that is we choose to ignore our conscience. When you're drunk, you've turned it off. But when we're sober and we're going through our life, a lot of times we get ourselves into trouble and we end up with all kinds of regrets relationally, academically, when it comes to making purchases, when it comes to our career, we end up with so many regrets because we chose to ignore our conscience. You see, God built within us a powerfully important tool that he uses to lead and guide us. That's right. It's called a conscience. And whenever we have options in life, whenever we're about to go and to make a decision, there is usually some measure of tension. And what I mean by that is when we're trying to decide whether to do this or that, 
a lot of times when it comes to one of the choices, there's going to be a tension, an uneasiness, some question that we feel on the, in, on the inside. You know, I've, I've always said that I don't know which is worse, to have no options or to have many options. But when we go to make a decision, we should, when we're confronted with the choices and we are examining which is going to be best for us, which is going to be best for our life, always remembering that there are generational consequences to decisions. Whenever we go to make a choice that's going to impact potentially generations to come, we should learn to ask ourselves the conscience question, and that is, is there a tension that deserves my attention? Is there a tension that deserves my attention? You see, this is where God is using your conscience. Because as you're trying to sort through what you should do and how you should go about it, in a lot of cases, one of them, or maybe even a few of them, just aren't going to feel right. It's going to be kind of a a red flag moment. You can't necessarily even put your finger on it. You can't really explain why, but something just doesn't seem right. That's your conscience. This is the thing that God put inside of you to help you make better decisions so that you'll have fewer regrets. My parents, I was raised in church. In fact, my father was a pastor. And when they would be facing decisions and they would be sorting through what was going to be best for them, what was going to be best for us, what was going to be best for the church. They relied heavily on this idea of paying attention to the tension. And they would call it, there's a check in my spirit. I'm not going to go this way. I'm not going to do that because I just feel a check in my spirit. There's not necessarily any rhyme or reason to how I feel or why I feel it, but it just doesn't seem right. And and I don't care what it is that you call it, whether it's a check in your spirit, a red flag moment, but when there is attention, you need to pay attention. When something dings your conscience, when something pops up on that internal radar regarding one of your choices, pay attention to the tension. If something bothers you, Don't rush through it. Don't let that big fat lying salesman in your head get you to make haste and to rush and to do something that you'll regret later. If something bothers you, let it bother you. Don't try to to push it away. Don't try to say, man, that's weird. I must have had some bad pizza last night. Face it. Face it. Let it Linger for a moment. Maul it around. Consider it. Don't excuse it. This is God's way of helping you to make decisions, particularly when you're unsure of where and how to go. You see, last week we talked about how the Bible, the Scripture, the Word of God, we talked about how the Bible is the Word of life. We talked about how it is the word of truth. We talked about how it is the mirror, mirror on the wall that's going to help us make the best decisions, both great and small. And the word of God has been given to us as a source of truth to help us. It is meant to order our steps. It is meant to illuminate how to live and where to walk. But today... We've got to talk about our conscience, this other tool, this other thing that God has put into our life because sometimes there's gray areas. What do you do? How do you make decision when it comes to the gray areas? What about when the Bible's silent? Maybe you decided, I do want to use the word of life. I do want to use the word of truth. I need this mirror, mirror. But now you're faced with making a decision that's not necessarily really clearly spelled out in the Bible. There's got to be something else to help you make your decisions. What do we do when we're facing a decision that's not directly addressed 
by the Bible, something that is not unethical, it's not immoral, it's not illegal. This is when God uses our conscience to help direct us. In the very beginning of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, there is a story about a young man, a talented, good-looking, up-and-coming future leader in God's kingdom with God's people by the name of Joseph. And Joseph was so blessed by God and so loved even by his earthly father that it made his family jealous. It made his brothers jealous. And so they actually came up with this plot to get him out of the picture. They sold him off into slavery and then presented a bloody tore up outer garment to their father and told him that a, a lion had killed and had eaten his son. And now Joseph is off in exile and he's spending time in prison and through a series of ups and downs, God is with him and starts to exalt him and to make a way in his life where there seems to be no way, where it seemed to be utterly hopeless because that's what God does. I just want to say to somebody here today that's feeling hopeless, that's feeling like you're in a pit or a prison, I want you to know that God's with you. And right now, even though you can't see it, He's working. And God is going to, in due time, He's going to get you out of that place and He's going to exalt you and He's going to put you somewhere where He can use your life for His glory. That's exactly what happened to Joseph. He was promoted out of the pit and out of the prison and he was put into the home of a very powerful man by the name of Potiphar. And while they're working, while taking care of Potiphar's estate, he was really the head of state for all of Potiphar. In fact, Genesis 39 verse number 6 says this, Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything that he owned. And everything sounds great at this point in time, but of course, there's some drama like it inevitably does. Some drama shows up and starts to play out. The Bible continues in Genesis and says that Joseph was a very handsome and he was a very well-built young man. He had a lot going for him. He's smart, he's good looking, he's ripped, he's making the whole house flourish. And it was not only appreciated by Potiphar, but it attracted some other attention as well. Potiphar's wife develops this secret attraction, this inappropriate longing and lust for Joseph. Genesis puts it like this, Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. And she says very directly, come and sleep with me, she demanded. I mean, it's apparent that girls went wild even back in the Bible days. She says, come and sleep with me, she demanded. And so now Joseph is at a crossroad. He is now required to make a decision. That's what this series is about, waking up in Vegas, making better decisions and have fewer regrets. But I want to talk about how the conscience plays a big part in helping us to act and helping us to move even when we're unclear. For example, Joseph at this time did not have the benefit of God's Word. He did not have the Bible. He did not have the Scripture. This story in Genesis actually predates Moses receiving the Ten Commandments. I want you to think about that. There is no written word of God. There is no written way of life that has been given to us from heaven that highlights God's preferences, that highlights God's ways for each and every one of us. In other words, Joseph had never gone to Sunday school to hear the Ten Commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. It just didn't exist. So, for Joseph, he's in a situation where he doesn't have God's word to help him make a decision. He doesn't know how to proceed. But look at Genesis chapter number 39. Joseph refused. When she came after him, Joseph refused. 
And this was his response. We see it in verse number nine. He says, look, my master, trust me with everything in his entire household. No one here has more authority than I do. He has held back nothing from me except for you because you are his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. Now, there was no word of God to outline or to highlight what was a sin against God. In fact, there was no real even concept of sin at this point in time. But it was the conscience, this gift that God had put inside of Joseph to help him make the right decision. Imagine if he would have not listened to his conscience and would have gone on to sleep with his boss's wife. It could have put into jeopardy everything in his future. And that was not the story that Joseph was wanting to write. So when it came time to make a decision, he paid attention to the tension. He listened to his conscience. You see, when the Bible is silent, and this is what I want to kind of wrap things up with here today. When the Bible is silent, there are three tools, three other tools that God gives us to sharpen and to supercharge our conscience. The first is wise counsel. You're going to hear us say it over and over again, that life is better connected, that we are better together. This is exactly why we encourage people during the week to get into a small group to put right relationships into their life because when you have wise counsel and you're around other people that love Jesus and who are also trying to listen to their conscience and make good decisions, who are also trying to be obedient to the Word of God and to be led by His Spirit, when you get wise counsel in your life and you're looking at a decision, they, from their perspective, could bring up a question, could ask a question, could point something out that you had not thought of that could help weigh into your decisions. Wise counsel is so very important. God wants you to have right people in your life. And in fact, I want you to look at the people that are advising you the most in some of the big decisions that you've made previously. Maybe if, if you've always got a bunch of regrets and, and you're always kind of ending up in some kind of a predicament, it may be a good clue that you need to get some new friendships and you need to get some other kinds of voices into your life. But God gives wise counsel to help us sharpen and supercharge our conscience. Another thing that he gives us, another tool, is this idea of peace. And the Apostle Peter, he explores this in that text that we read together just a few moments ago in 1 Peter chapter number 3. He says that if you want to, if you want to live a blessed life, then you need to follow peace. That you need to feel after peace so that you have a good conscience, so that you live with a clean conscience. Peter said that we are going to have a clear conscience by following peace. And what he means, and what I'm trying to help to teach you here today, is that if we will seek to detect peace in our decisions, again, we're at a crossroads, and maybe we have many decisions Pursue the one that leaves you with a feeling of peace. Follow peace. Pursue peace. I can remember when my family and I were praying about what we were supposed to do with our lives, what we were supposed to do with our calling. This was before we moved to Mooresville to pursue planting Waterview Church, which we just did in January of this year. We've been going at this, guys, eight months. Can you believe what God is doing? But I remember as we were looking into where we were going to go, what we were going to do, we knew that we were going to plan a church. We knew that God had called us to do that, but we didn't know exactly where. So we made a list of six places 
six or seven places that we would like to live. And we went and we visited each and every one of them. We made a site visit because we were trying to make the best decision. We were trying to make a God decision. We knew that this was going to not just impact Jason and Alejandra Bentley, but it was going to impact Dylan and Micah Bentley and then grandkids and not to mention the people that would be coming to our church and their kids and their grandkids. We recognized that there was a lot that hinged on this decision. And let me tell you, the Bible, there's nowhere in the Bible that says, Jason Bentley, thou shalt move to this city. It was one of those gray areas. I had to make a decision. And so I visited all of the sites. And that is when I was feeling after peace. I knew that God had given me a conscience and that peace, peace was going to allow me to have a good and a clean conscience. And I went to one spot. And although I liked the city for many reasons, I just didn't feel that peace. And I visited another and another and another. And it wasn't until I came to Mooresville and spent time here. And I can't even explain it. I really can't even articulated, there was just a feeling of peace. I knew that this was where God wanted us to be, so I made that decision. I followed peace. I pursued peace. And can I tell you, every single day since, I have woke up and I have thanked God for the privilege of being able to live and pastor right here in Lake Norman, North Carolina. The last thing that God gives us to sharpen and to supercharge our conscience is the leading of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said this in John 16, 13. He said, when the spirit of truth comes, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. He says, when the spirit of truth comes, he is going to guide you into all truth. That the Holy Spirit is going to lead you and guide you into truth. Well, what's truth? The best decision to make the best way to go forward. He will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has heard. In other words, the Holy Spirit is going to only communicate to you the will of God. And the will of God is always best, and it's always perfect, and it's always pleasing, and it's always got your best interest in mind. And it says he, the Holy Spirit, is going to tell you about your future, meaning he's going to illuminate to you which is the best thing for you to do. As Christians, as Jesus people, we have got to be marked and led by the Holy Spirit. Our faith cannot be dead, dry, traditional, ritualistic. That's why we say here at our church that we make the presence and power of the Holy Spirit a priority. It has got to be working actively in our lives. And I'm sure that there's many of you that could learn a lot more about the Holy Spirit and we're here to help you on that journey. I will tell you this, whether you've just heard about the Holy Spirit or you've had some experiences with Him here or there over the years, there is more. There is so much that the Holy Spirit has for each and every one of us. But letting the Holy Spirit lead your, lead your life and for you to be able to walk by the Holy Spirit, that is a choice that you need to make each and every day. So this is how you go about being led by the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is going to help your conscience and that's going to help you make right decisions. Number one, you just need to pray that God baptizes you and fills you with the Holy Spirit. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is something that must be asked for. It's a gift. Jesus said that, that our Heavenly Father is eager, eager to give it to us. But we have got to ask for it, which means that we have to open ourselves up to the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. We got to take all limitations off of Him and say to Him, Lord, whatever you have for me, I'm game. I'm good. I want it. I'm here for it. Let's go. Come on. Open yourself up to the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. And then as you're going through your day, as you're walking out your life, watch and listen for opportunities to obey the Spirit's prompting. Listen. 
You're going to be in situations. You're going to face choices. You're going to be in scenarios where you feel and you hear an unexplainable nudge. The Lord's going to talk to you. You're going to have this sense that one thing is not good and is dangerous and another is beneficial. That this person you should go into business with, this other you should not. Listen for and to the Holy Spirit's prompting and then choose to obey what he highlights to you. You know what made the church in the very beginning, despite so much persecution and despite so much opposition, you know what made them so powerful? What made Christianity the worldwide force it is today? Why God's church is still strong and why it's still moving forward? and why it's still the hope of the world. The church in the beginning, they leaned heavily on their conscience that was supercharged and highly activated by the Holy Spirit. In fact, we see it in Acts chapter number 15 when they would go to make decisions. And this is where I got the title of my message today from. They would say, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit, and to us. They're making decisions, and it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. The Holy Spirit and our conscience together just is giving us the sense, the impression that this is right. It seems good. It seems good. And I pray that that is going to be the story of each and every one of us, that going forward, as we rely on the Holy Spirit, as the Holy Spirit just supercharges our conscience, that when we make decisions, we'll say, well, it seems good. It seems good to us and to the Holy Spirit. That's what can happen when we filter our decisions through the Holy Spirit empowered conscience question. It seems good good to us, and to the Holy Spirit. Hey, I'm closing now, but like Joseph, you want to be the hero in your story? Like Joseph, do you want to write a story that you'll be proud to tell? Like Joseph, would, would you like to be able to share with your kids and to your grandkids something that's not embarrassing and something that's not shameful? Ask yourself when you're forced to make a decision, is there a tension that deserves my attention? In closing, here's how you can make better decisions and therefore can live with fewer regrets. Check for tension. Call for advisors. Look for peace. And listen for the Holy Spirit. I close with reminding you of what it said in Psalms 143. I have put my trust in you. This is what we're trying to do now to prevent us ever waking up in Vegas again in our life. I have put my trust in you. Show me the way that I should go. Show me which decision that I should make. For to you I entrust my life. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God, and may your good spirit lead me on level ground. I love that. We're trusting in him so that he can tell us where to go and how we should go, and his good spirit is going to lead us. That's my prayer, and that's what I hope that you will decide to do today. What I hope is that you'll pray Psalms 143 in this moment and just surrender to Jesus. In fact, will you do that? Bow your head and close your eyes. And let's, let's pray this prayer together. Lord, I put my trust in you because I recognize that you are the one true God. You are going to be the Lord and the leader of my life, so show me the way that I should go. I have entrusted my life to you. Teach me your word and show me your ways for you are my God from this day forward Jesus I'm going to live for you and I want you to help me with your word and with a 
Holy Spirit-fueled conscience. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. Whether it's relationally, financially, academically, professionally, in all of the main areas of my life, help me to make better decisions. I live for you. I surrender to you. I'm yours. I'm going to follow you the rest of my days. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, come on, family. Amen. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me and oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free. I'm a child of God, yes I am. Free at last, He has ransomed me, His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, He died for me, who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am, in my Father's house. There's a place for me, I'm a child of God, yes I am. And I am chosen, not forsaken, I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am, I am chosen, not forsaken, I am who you say I am, you are for me, not against me, I am who you say I am, oh I am who you say I am. I'm a child of God, yes I am, in my Father's house, there's a place for me, I'm a child of God, yes I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me, cause I'm a child of God, yes I am. As you've heard, you've got a lot of advantages when you use your conscience, when you're relying on wise counsel, when you are trying to feel after peace and when you're listening to the leading of the Holy Spirit. What I want you to know today is you can't lose. And I'm believing that this week and this next month and all the days that are ahead of you are going to be filled with good things because Psalms 143 promised that his good spirit would take us on level ground, not bumpy up and down all over the place ground, good ground. So today, make a fresh start. Make that decision to align yourself with Jesus, to surrender to his word and to his ways. 
And if you're ready to make that decision, if you, when you prayed that prayer a moment ago, decided fully and completely in your heart that Jesus is the way, not just for someone else, but for you, click the link that says Fresh Start that's coming up below. We want to celebrate with you and we want to help you as you walk out this great faith adventure. Click that link, Fresh Start, and it's a digital connection card. Put your basic contact information there. We're going to send you a free resource. It's called Following Jesus, and it's going to help you continue to make good decisions. And also, I want to say again, we are so glad that you're here with us. Whether you are returning or this is your first, second, or third time. If you're new, we consider you to be a VIP. And this is all about you. We want you to come to know Jesus, the real Jesus, and to live this abundant, overcoming, fruitful, flourishing, fulfilling life that he's got for you. So let's connect. Take a moment. There's a link that's coming up below that says VIP. And again, in case you're wondering, that's you. Click that link that says VIP. It's a digital connection card. Your basic contact information is what we're looking for, not because we're going to do anything weird with it. In fact, we have a hassle-free guarantee, which means that we're not going to give your info to anyone and we're not going to just show up at your house uninvited or at your job. Nothing like that. We want to pray for you and we want to keep you posted on all that is happening in the life of our church. So click that link fill out your contact information, and let's be friends. Come on, don't be lonely. Let's do this together. God is doing some really wonderful things, and you need to be a part of it. And because you are trusting us enough with your information, we're going to honor you and that confidence in us by right now, right out of the gate, starting to change the world together. If you fill out that VIP digital connection card, we're going to feed a child in extreme poverty three meals in one day in your honor in the country of Honduras or in the country of Ethiopia through our global partner, One Child. So, hey, online family, come on, let's give it up for all of our VIPs. Let's show some love. Let's welcome people today. Let's include them in what's going on. We're growing. We're moving. We're progressing. God is so good. We're continuing waking up in Vegas next weekend. So, hey, do me a favor. Get in a small group this week. Tell a few friends about what you're learning and what God is doing here and invite them to join you. Just share this message on Facebook and tell a friend, tag a friend on Instagram, whatever you got to do. Come on, let's get the word out and let's go. Let's make our life matter. Let's see what God is going to do next weekend. We love you guys. See you next week.